a pleasure to listen to, to Arthur speak. And I think his name kind of is slightly wrong. I think the gold bit is right, but it's like it should be struck gold because what Arthur shares with us is as valuable as gold. And um, he's going to talk about business trends uh, and it's trends that are shaping business and society today. It's a two part uh, talk and it's going to be obviously today's bit and then part two will be on the 21st of April at the same time. And really what Arthur is going to be talking about, what can we learn from the past that will help us prepare for the future? And I think that is crucial. It's we often go through the past, but we don't use those lessons. And hopefully Arthur is going to unpack that for us. Um, and it's just looking at the past, the present and the future. And Arthur's main focus is on the, the technology and technology trends. If we have a look um, at what Arthur is about, if I had to go through everything and talk about Arthur, my introduction would be longer than the speech. Um, he's an international award-winning writer. He's an analyst, a commentator. He's, he writes for many newspapers. He comments on many um, radio stations. Uh, he runs a business called Worldwide Works, and they do market research and unpacking how the technology is affecting the world. And this is what Arthur's going to be talking to us about. But besides that, you know, I was talking to somebody recently who was saying they've, they're deciding to read quite a few books. There's one thing to read books. There's another thing to write them. And Arthur has written 19 books. These are just some of the books that he has written over time and some of them you'll be aware of and, and a lot maybe not. So The Rabbit in the Thorn Tree, I think was a very famous book, The Leopard in the Luggage also. Um, and there's a whole lot of others. So unbelievable to have written 19 different books. And it's, it's the knowledge that goes into these books that allows Arthur to explain and to see the future. Um, and because he's been doing it so long and commentating on, on this. And so there's a very famous quote that I love, and it's by Yogi Berra that says, the future's not what it used to be. Um, and that is, uh, in fact, Yogi Berra was actually a baseball player and, and Yogi Bear was built on him. And he used to come up with these crazy sayings without even knowing that he was saying them. And this was one of his, the future's not what it used to be. And, if there's anybody who understands this, it's Arthur. So Arthur, I'm gonna hand over to you and please tell us what the future will be. And so we can prepare ourselves for that future. Thank you. Thank you for those very kind words, David. It's uh, much appreciated. I was going to say that um, no pants are required to attend this uh, meeting uh, as long as you kept only the top half visible, but I see most of you are not visible at all. So I presume you're not wearing anything. That's just the assumption that goes with uh, the kind of picture that I'm seeing in front of me. Um, but uh, if you want to show yourself, I see a couple of you are showing yourself. Um, I'm actually going to ask you to just come on screen for a moment and uh, just your top half, um, I insist. And I'm going to ask you to do a little uh, exercise for me. Hey, great to see everyone coming on screen. Thank you. And I'm going to ask you to give me a lockdown meter of your life over the past year. And you're going to do it like this. You're going to put your um, hand flat across this, the bottom of the screen like this. And then um, I'm going to ask you, but not yet, don't move your hands yet, but when I ask you to, uh, those for whom life in lockdown has been meh or negative or gone backwards, you'll keep your hands there. Those for whom it's been okay, you've, uh, you've got by, uh, life kind of as normal, go there. And for those who have actually found that business and uh, social life and family life has improved, uh, you can go like uh, that. 
So this will give us an instant meter of uh, lockdown lives of the attendees. So on the count of three, one, two, three. And that gives us a fascinating picture. Instantly we see the average is like this. You've managed to uh, maintain a grip on your lives. Almost everyone in this uh, audience, some of you are down there, some of you are up there, but on average, people are getting by. And it shows that people learn to cope with this massive change that's happened in society and in our environment. But the change you've seen in the last, uh, let's say 13 months, is only the precursor to massive change that's coming. And to put that in context, I'm going to give a bit of a history lesson. In a way, it's a history of the future because it looks at the way the future was seen in the past. And I'll take that through to what has been happening over the past year as well. So that will set the scene. And then next uh, week for part two, we're going to look at the careers of the future in the context of all the changes that we've seen. Mm -hmm. And it'll give you a good understanding of why uh, the, some careers will vanish and uh, new ones will arrive, but also what the demands will be of mm -hmm. uh, those careers. So I'm going to, you can, uh, shut down the screens if you want to. You're welcome to keep them on. Um, and another harsh rule quickly is cats are allowed, dogs as well, but they tend to be more uh, disruptive. And kids are also allowed. Quite happy to see any intrusions of that kind. The shape of the future is really the story of the Roaring Twenties. And everyone knows the Roaring Twenties as the 1920s. And this is one of the uh, classic scenes, people being liberated from the past, both in terms of gender roles, but also in terms of mobility. And I'm talking about mobility, not just through automobiles, but also mobility in society and across roles. This is the classic scene of the Roaring Twenties. Post-World War II, post the Spanish flu, the world seemed to go mad. Mostly the Americans, of course. These were the Americans practicing the Roaring Twenties. But I can guarantee that we're going to see the 2020s equivalent of these kind of scenes playing themselves out over the next decade as we all come out of lockdown. People are going to go socially crazy. This is the catalyst for the original Roaring Twenties. Firstly, the end of the war and the Spanish flu. It unleashed massive uh, growth in the US across not just business, but also in terms of cultural awareness and cultural awakening in the United States. Uh, GDP grew massively from 1920 to 1929 before the Great Depression uh, hit. And the United States became a consumer society which then also had a major impact on the rest of the world. The world took its lead from American consumerism. We saw a similar pattern after World War II with uh, the baby boomers, which was very much an American phenomenon, but now it's become commonplace to talk about baby boomers in every other country. In fact, we don't have boomers in this country. We didn't have that post-war uh, baby boom that the Americans did, but we tend to have fallen into that same cultural imperialism of the United States. And from a, a cultural point of view, jazz was actually one of the uh, great catalysts for the future of popular culture because it gave birth to rock and roll, which gave birth to numerous other uh, cultural segments as well. And then, of course, uh, women got the right to vote in 1920, which led to liberation across numerous areas of society. Ironically, it would take another 40 years before um, women truly liberated themselves in the, in the United States. After the harsh domesticity of the 1950s, we finally saw the um, flower power era of the 1960s bring women fully into their own. This to me is one of the 
great images of the 1920s, the formation of the royal order of flappers. They didn't have uh, the uh, royal consent of um, the monarch of the United Kingdom, which is usually what is required for something called the royal order in the English speaking uh, world. They just called themselves that, but they officially made the term flappers one that was almost a, a badge of achievement. If you were one of the flappers, you were part of the in crowd. And it's going to be fascinating to see in the coming decade, what equivalence to the flappers we are going to see because mark my words, we will see new subcultures emerge around the uh, post COVID-19 liberation from lockdown. And then we come to our 20s, the new roaring 20s, according to The Economist. And this was just a few weeks ago where they saw us entering a new era of innovation. And the echoes from the 1920s are quite uh, dramatic. This is The Economist on the 16th of January this year. A dawn of technological optimism is breaking. Prominent breakthroughs, a tech investment boom, the adoption of digital technologies, and hopes of a new era of progress. It absolutely echoes the kind of sentiments that were expressed in the beginning of the 1920s, a sense of new optimism, breakthroughs, social breakthroughs at the time, now technological breakthroughs. But in the, 20, in the 1920s, we also saw significant uh, technology breakthroughs. Um, but this is a warning from the uh, economist, just as the pessimism of the 2010s was overdone, so predictions of technological utopia are overblown. Uh, but the real hope is that the new era of innovation will lift our living standards, and in particular, if governments help new technologies to flourish. The problem, of course, is that governments aren't always in a hurry for technology to flourish. We've seen in South Africa that our government talks about the fourth industrial revolution. In fact, they keep talking about it and they keep doing nothing to make it a reality. So it's become more of a political slogan than a reality. And while government talks about it, business gets on with, with the business of making the fourth industrial revolution a reality. But we'll come back to that in the second part of this series. This is a big new technology that we can expect in the coming years and through the 2020s. Artificial intelligence already is changing the way businesses conduct the activities, especially businesses with very large customer bases. The banks, the telcos and the like are finding that they cannot in fact serve their massive customer bases without using artificial intelligence algorithms that can handle large amounts of inquiries or process large amounts of customer information without human intervention. And when you experience bad customer service and an inability to reach anyone in, in an organization, it's usually a sign of poor use of artificial intelligence. And what it really tells you is that even if they are using AI, they're not particularly good at using it, or the AI isn't ready for mainstream yet. So Vodacom, for example, has a chatbot called Toby, T-O-B-I, no relationship uh, to Toby Shapshak, not nearly as intelligent as he is. And you usually find after around two or three interactions with Toby, it refers you to a human being because it just doesn't have the smarts, the intelligence to actually take you where you want to go. Robotic process automation, known for short as RPA, is a technology behind chatbots. It uses AI, but primarily uh, it uses uh, menus and uh, data uh, bases of answers to set questions. And when it simply uses that kind of technique, that's when it can't really help you with your uh, queries. And we see it across numerous large organizations. Discovery Health is a good example where uh, their chatbot, for example, is utterly useless at getting anything that uh, you can't get from a menu. So menu-based queries are still superior to what chatbots deliver through RPA. 
but then cloud-based business modeling, launching and operating of uh, businesses. We already know the cloud is key to everything we do online. Uh, if it weren't for the cloud, you couldn't use Zoom right now. You couldn't use Gmail. You couldn't use online banking, for um, example. But where it's going to go in the 2020s is that it'll be possible to structure and model a business online, launch it online and operate it online. Already there are many like that, but most of them are still a combination of offline and online. And in most cases, much of the modeling has to happen offline, but the cloud will enable you to, with a click of a few buttons, download a business in the future. And then 5G will arrive globally soon in South Africa later, it seems. Government is in no rush, it, uh, the regulator is in no rush to ensure that we can get 5G. They keep putting obstacles in front of themselves while trying to uh, license uh, or auction the spectrum that will make 5G possible. But when it does arrive, it does mean that the current wait for things to load, the current wait to connect to services and the like, the lags that we tend to experience, all of those will go away. Virtual and augmented reality, which in combination are known as X reality, is also coming to the fore. Largely, it's proving itself in the world of training. It's a fantastic way to simulate situations where it would be too expensive or too dangerous to train a large amount of people uh, physically. More and more, we're seeing experiments to try and bring uh, that uh, technology into the world of e-commerce and even banking. I don't believe those are viable because it's already painful to look through products when you're shopping. Now you've got to do it with a headset on as well. I don't think so. And then blockchain is the big mystery um, ingredient, you could say, because no one actually knows um, how it's constructed, how it works, or what it does. What I do know is that it's the foundation for something called Bitcoin, which has resulted in, in one of the uh, most hyped up new transaction technologies uh, that we've seen in the past few decades. The uh, price of Bitcoin is somewhere between 50 and $70,000 right now for one Bitcoin. If you had bought a, a Bitcoin back in uh, 2011 or 2012, you would have paid less than a dollar for a Bitcoin. So that explains to you why there are numerous Bitcoin billionaires out there. The biggest challenge is getting their money out of the blockchain, but there are ways and means, and you can buy things ranging from uh, pizzas to houses with uh, Bitcoin. And um, this um, reminds me to tell you that uh, the very first purchase using Bitcoin was of a pizza. And the equivalent cost of that pizza back in 2011, in terms of the Bitcoin that was spent on it, would be worth several million dollars today. So the most expensive pizza ever bought was uh, through uh, uh, Bitcoin. Um, there's a couple that I've left out of here and you might want to raise some of your favorite emerging technologies that might not feature here and I can talk about those as well. But wait, listen to Stephen Hawking. The development of full artificial intelligence could spell the end of the human race. And even an expert on AI, the president of the Association for the Advancement of AI in 2015, said that a fully autonomous system is one that we have no control over. And I don't think we ever want to be in that situation. And then you've also had Elon Musk talking about artificial intelligence as a great evil. So already the experts are sounding warning bells. But the reality is they sound a lot like the experts of a long time ago. It's a very old movie, in fact. This was Mr. William Orton, and the shock in his face is probably after he saw what Alexander Graham Bell's invention was really worth. It was offered to him by George Sanders, not by Alexander Graham Bell. There's a common misconception that Bell himself tried to sell his phone to Western Union. But in fact, he was off on honeymoon with um, his uh, new bride when his father-in-law of all people um, got together with George Sanders, who was an investor in Bell's business. 
and they decided that they wanted to cash in on their investment and they didn't think this thing was ever going to take off. So let's see if we can make some money out of it. And they took it off to William Orton at Western Union to flog it to him for $100,000. It's a bit like the Bitcoin that was used to buy a pizza uh, back in 2011. And like most people dismissing Bitcoin, William Orton couldn't see this as being viable or a reality. It had far too many shortcomings to be seriously considered as a means of communication. But look at that, inherently of no value to us. And within a couple of years, Bell himself had taken the technology forward. It found more investors, more business cases, and he and his company and its successors would go on to rule telecommunications, the phone business for the next century. It wasn't long before it came to South Africa either. Only 11 years behind. These days, we talk about our technology being six to 12 months behind America. A decade ago, we used to talk about being 18 to 36 months behind America. So it took quite a while for us to catch up. But back then, we were 11 years behind. Uh, I don't know if any of you remember. Some of you, I think, were around, David. You might remember Adolf Butker, owner of a Cape Town watchmaker shop. I think Paul Mills, who's attending here from Cape Town, will probably have had dealings with Adolf uh, back then, who brought the first phones in from Siemens and Halske in 1878, and he brought them in to sell them. And they proved to be quite popular. And uh, within a decade and a half, the city had its own exchange. And th the fascinating thing then was to see how everyone wanted the coolest new handset, if they were extremely wealthy, because the cost of this kind of device was excessive and the average person was happy with just a speaking tube. But you can see the idea that we have today that a smartphone has to be the coolest and the uh, best looking and most fashionable was already around back in 1895. We've always been um, uh, creatures of um, influence from what is cool and fashionable. This was um, the phone that I used growing up. Uh, that's a hundred years later after that first uh, phone or after that uh, beautiful Ericsson phone, we were still using stuff like that looked like this in Tromsberg. And we used to have to dial up that little handle on the side, not dial it, rather uh, turn that handle on the side and the exchange would answer and, you would, and they would say, no more a brief. And you would say, Nomar three faith, I believe, and she would say, uh, "Sorry, but Tani Esther is not ready. I need to say um pit. Actually, your dear said not um pit." So that was actually social media at its very best, because uh, today you simply don't have that kind of personal interaction with technology. So it might have been a hundred years behind the times, but it was way ahead in terms of uh, social interaction. But I have to confess that I'm very happy to have moved on from uh, that technology. It's actually what gave me a hunger, a thirst for high tech and for advanced technology because I was desperate for real communication. But let's go back to the 1920s. This was the Netflix of its time, the very first TV set ever demonstrated. And I'll tell you in a moment who the gentleman uh, is. But the significant thing here is that the response to the first TV was very similar to the attitude that a lot of the experts have today towards uh, artificial intelligence. This is the New York Times. The problem with television is that people must sit and keep their eyes glued to a screen. The average American family hasn't time for it. This is before TV had even arrived. And then the very next year, um, the first successful demonstration of a TV was held by one Philo Farnsworth, a 21-year-old kid. He had lived in a house without electricity until he was 14, and he used to plow the fields. And from watching the patterns made by the plows, he came up with the idea of television broadcast using lines of light uh, that could uh, represent images. So it was a fascinating insight into how one didn't have to grow up with all the high tech or with all the advantages or with the resources to be able to exercise your imagination and using simple 
human ingenuity coming up with new ideas. And I believe this is one of the key lessons for uh, the next decade for anyone going into any uh, career. It doesn't matter if you have all the advantages in the world, human ingenuity will always trump the easy access to online information. Let's fast forward now. Who remembers that uh, technology? Um, it's, uh, it's a common test to see how old you are. If you know uh, what the purpose of the pencil is, then you're over a certain age. If you don't know, then you're below a certain age. So I'm not going to test you. I won't put you in that uh, situation. But this was basically how fast forward used to work uh, back in the day. So let's look at the new high tech of 2016. And this was a fascinating event. This is the launch of the Samsung S7, which was launched in conjunction with the Gear VR headset. And that's the device that everyone in the audience is wearing on their heads. And they were told to put on their headsets, which were next to their seats at the launch event in Barcelona. And while they were staring into artificial reality, uh, a young man by the name of Mark Zuckerberg walked onto stage. And essentially they had conned him, okay, they persuaded him to get on stage to talk about how virtual reality uh, would be the next platform for interaction in social media. And uh, it was entertaining, uh, probably as entertaining as what was being shown on the Gear VR headsets. Among others, uh, the Avengers from Marvel Comics, um, their new game was being demonstrated on those headsets, which says it's, it's hard to tell which was more entertaining, but certainly to grab the headlines, it was a fantastic way of telling people, okay, take off your headsets and look who's on stage. So it was kind of cool for some people, but the image actually is intensely creepy because what you're really seeing is Zuckerberg walking past his minions while they are locked up in an artificial reality and he's scheming up new ways to extract their data and their money. This is the problem though with VR in 2016. It had been under development for something like 26 years at that point in terms of commercial machines. That was the first truly commercial VR machine from Virtuality Systems. It was called the Cyber. And in fact, it was brought to South Africa a few years after it was um, invented in, in around 1995. And I got to play with it at the time and was utterly underwhelmed by the experience. It was cool, slaying dragons, fighting knights, etc., uh, in an artificial world. But the graphics were so poor and so pixelated that I came out of it thinking, well, real reality is far superior to virtual reality. And fast forward to 2016 with the Gear VR, I had the same experience. And the Gear VR, although it sometimes provides wonderfully immersive experiences, does not match up to reality. So after 26 years, VR had still not lived up to its original promise. And that's when you can tell that a technology is not going to take over the world. Until you have truly photorealistic live video type uh, imagery around you and you can't tell the difference between the real world um, and the fake world, then uh, VR is not going to take over uh, the world. The bottom line really is that it's not the technology that will dictate the future but the use case for that technology. In other words, how it will be put into practice. And this is a fantastic example. The first drones that were um, released onto the market were these very cool devices that you could use to take aerial photography and photos of yourself in action doing various dangerous things. But it truly came into its own when some people discovered that they could combine drone video photography with analysis of images using things like infrared technology. So they could start doing crop analysis. But it wasn't just the drone and it wasn't just the video and it wasn't just looking at video and doing the analysis of that video. It used 
an intensive form of artificial intelligence to process the video, to match it against a large database of existing imagery that could allow the software to detect changes in crops, in uh, soil conditions, in uh, broader environments, not just uh, agricultural, but also urban, and start providing guidance on how to respond to what was being picked up uh, by the artificial intelligence in the videos recorded by the drones. So drones are now becoming one of the most powerful tools for optimizing agriculture globally. And South Africa has got one of the world leaders in this technology, a company called Air Robotics, also based in Cape Town. I don't know what it is about Cape Town. Uh, must be the mountain, which gives people um, a broader imagination, I believe. But that um, imagination of what you could do with drones has made Air Robotics a world leader in the technology with a massive investment pouring into it from around uh, the world. Um, it doesn't have to be high tech that you're dealing with. It can be extremely low tech and it can be very ancient uh, technology. Um, this is the story of a bookseller called antiquarianauctions.com. And this is actually an image from their website, the kind of uh, books that they sell. And I'm very pleased to say that in the audience with us today, we have Paul Mills, the owner of Antiquarian uh, Auctions. So we might put him on the spot later um, as well. And I'll tell you quickly his story. His son, Tony, worked for Paul while he was doing computer studies, which meant that he understood the rare book business and programming, very rare combination. Not only that, his girlfriend was a data analyst and her brother knew social media marketing. So that combination allowed antiquarian auctions to become the leading player in its field in South Africa and one of the leaders in the world for that matter. But the emphasis was on the South African market or at least on South African clientele and selling South African books largely. Although they did have a fairly good selection of international works um, as well. But with COVID-19, uh, suddenly a new opportunity arose. And this is why when you all put up your hands earlier, uh, Paul probably had his hand uh, vertical because they suddenly found themselves in an entirely new environment where a US promoter of uh, books and antiques and similar fairs approached them to create an auction site for them because they couldn't find the appropriate people to do it at the right price in the United States. So that unique combination of skills of the old and the new put them in a situation where they were able to become world leaders and not just leaders in South Africa. They've already run more than a dozen events um, across the world, all from Cape Town, again, Cape Town. And this is 143 years after that tool first arrived um, in the city. So it's fascinating to see how the old and the new came together so powerfully to provide a new platform and a new business opportunity for a very ancient uh, business. With that, let me give you a brief history of uh, tomorrow, which starts with this particular industry. It's used as a byword for obsolescence, not the horse and not the cart, but the horse whip. Yes, the horse buggy as well, but the horse whip industry is used as almost a symbol of how a technology died over, or an industry died overnight as a result of the evolution of uh, transport or of a particular technology, in this case, the automobile. So the automobile killed off the thriving industry of horse whip makers. But it's in fact used so constantly because it's such a great analogy for what keeps happening. And we, keep, we tend to think it's only happening now, that it's only artificial intelligence and automation that's killing off uh, industries. But with every new invention, we are seeing old technologies becoming unnecessary. Netflix and, and it's like Disney Plus, Apple Plus, all the pluses that are trying to stream video at you are uh, all going to result in traditional broadcast TV dying out. The only thing that's keeping broadcast TV alive, the only two things rather, are sports and news. And we're talking live sports there. And even there, 
Um, Amazon in some territories has won the rights to broadcast the English Premier League over its Amazon Prime video service. Still very limited because it's a highly lucrative um, fr a franchise for broadcast TV around the world. But it's the beginning of the demise of broadcast TV. Let me take you through a couple of other industries that are seeing a similar de uh, demise, also because they weren't able to keep up with the times. This to me is symbolic of the magazine industry. This is Drum in 1955 with Miriam Makeba on the cover. They were in fact um, the first to really discover uh, Miriam and to uh, promote her and make her into a household name before she went into exile uh, from South Africa. So you would think that this forward looking publication would try to keep up with the times, but this is drum last year, Shaw Majorzi, the uh, modern equivalent or the 2020s equivalent, you could say of Miriam Makeba in terms of being a household name. But aside from celebrity gossip and the like, the basic concept of the magazine hadn't changed at all and it still relied heavily on its print presence. Well, at the end of last year, drum ceased publication. The drum stopped beating and it became the equivalent of the horsewhip of the 1920s. So at the end of 2020, this is where you would tend to find drum as opposed to uh, on the newsstands. And then this is the next um, industry that we're going to see dying in this country. On the 31st of May this year, uh, less than um, two months from now, the final music outlet will close its doors. A few years ago, Look and Listen closed down and they were the dominant music chains in South Africa. From the 31st of May, we will no longer have the concept of a music chain in this country. Why? because the digital storm has swept them away. This was the story of the compact disc. And if you were sitting in the year 2000, looking at where the compact disc had come, and you looked at that trend line, you would have said, this is an incredibly healthy industry. I'm going to invest in this industry. I'm going to pursue a career in this industry. I'm going to tie uh, my coattails to this industry, and then suddenly you would have fallen off the cliff. And this is truly the story of uh, technology, of te technological innovation, and of the impact of new technology on old. So if you look at any te uh, technology platform or area where you see that kind of growth, but where you also see new versions, new alternatives coming along in the future, you can expect the same kind of, um, of um, sorry, I've just been told by my computer that, my, that it's about to die on me. So if that does happen, then we'll uh, carry on probably through my phone, but let's see how quickly we can get through this. And so the big question is, which industry is next? We'll be talking about that next week, but the principles to, uh, to understand how that question can be answered is that the present is already the past. Everything that you see today that dominates in particular sectors is already history. So if you see Netflix dominant uh, today, bear in mind that it's at the peak of a curve and it might still have some room to grow, but at some point it's going to start descending down the other side. If you look at Facebook, absolutely dominant uh, globally. And you imagine that it's going to continue to be dominant. It's also on a curve and it is going to start going down the other side at some point. Here are the keys to the future. This is what you need to embrace and absorb in terms of addressing the next decade. What do you want your life to look like in 2030? What steps do you need to take to make that possible? And when you have thought that through, you start executing those steps by paying attention to what's happening today and the events and industries and trends today that will shape the coming years, partly 
through attending talks like this, but also being aware, reading, um, searching, especially if you're trying to decide what career to go into. You have a responsibility to research all the factors that go into making up that industry and that will change that industry in the coming years. You've got to take that first step tomorrow if you want to write your own history of the future. To understand the careers of tomorrow, we invite you to join us next Wednesday for the final thrilling episode of this two-part uh, series brought to you not by Netflix, but by Alt SA. Thank you very much. <laughs>